Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And now, Rish Outfield, Big Anklevich, and what is this? Hey, folks! Welcome to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. What he said. I'm Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. And this is a <clears throat> this is a special episode. We don't even know what the number is, correct? I think we're at one... Th- Oh, no, we don't, huh? Because this is just going to drop whenever. Well, we'll just uh, leave that open. Uh, Insert episode number here. Don't do it. You don't know where it's been. (laughs) So, like I said, this is kind of a special episode. How how do we... Well, you talk. I'll just lay here. Okay. Uh, (laughs) We are at the New Media Expo right now, and uh, we're doing our special promised episode which is we got all the podcasters that we could find that we knew and we wrangled them up lassos and ropes and whips and chains we're involved we 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 recorded a reading of a story by just a a stellar author a rising star in uh some circle i'm not sure what yes but john miro hurt his back and so we had to do one of mine oh yeah that's right i forgot so anyways, we're going to go ahead and get right to the story, and then when we get back, we're going to invite all the people who helped us to record this story to join us in the after show, after story chat. The story is Office Visit by Rish Outfield. About the author. No, oh, that's not necessary, right? Play the story, please. Okay, play the story. I think you probably know who the author is. You've, you've heard of him before, so take it away. Office Visit by Rish Outfield McKay was a little town. So little, in fact, that its major business was the gas station. There were no tourist destinations or historical monuments in McKay, and nobody who came from there ever went on to be famous. No mail was delivered in town. No one bought their groceries in McKay's supermarket. There wasn't one. No stoplights controlled traffic on Main Street. There was no McDonald's's in McKay. To eat a Big Mac, you had to drive south to Praisden or Miller's Fork, or north to Provo. But bizarrely, there was a dentist's office. It was a tiny building, just a couple of rooms, on Main, right between the post office and the hair salon. Not many people went there. There were clinics in other towns, dental centers in the cities. And soon the office closed. Sally Riddick, who had lived in McKay all her life, promptly forgot the office ever existed. Sure, she noticed the businesses that were open, the stationery and greeting card shop, the little recycling station that was only open on weekends, the Mexican market, the post office, and gas station, of course, but her gaze just moved right past the defunct dentist's office. Jeannie McFarland, who had only been in McKay for half her life, six years that was, was a bit more observant about the place if only because she despised going to the dentist and had seen it sit abandoned for almost three school years. She was among the first to notice when that spring the doors opened again. A new dentist had moved in, initially holding business hours only a couple of days a week, probably hoping to expand as he built his client list. Of course, nobody went, at first. One Saturday, when the girls were tooling around Main Street, spending their babysitting money, Jeannie pointed it out to her best friend. Wow, Sally said. I didn't even know there was an office there. And there it stood, modest, nondescript, kind of pathetic, the new business in town. And it wasn't booming. In fact, the girls even walked up to the door to check to see if it was open today. The receptionist, a bored woman with ratty-looking red hair, glanced up at the girls, then quickly went back to doing nothing. My dad says nobody can make a living in McKay unless they're already retired, Sally said. Jeannie nodded, thinking she ought to give her own father a call. Her parents had been divorced for six years. It was why her mom had moved her here. Too bad, Sally said, walking through the empty parking lot. Yeah, I wonder if he has kids, Jeannie said, then smiled. Did you notice his name? When? On the door? (laughs) And she chuckled. No. Sally glanced back, but couldn't read it from there. She turned to her friend, who was still grinning. What's funny? 
His name. It's Dr. Plowman. (laughs) Sally laughed, too. That was a funny name. It was a good town for bicycle riding, with a lot of roads and not a lot of traffic, and a nice little decline on the south side of town where you could get going pretty fast if you were brave enough. Summer vacation had just started, and Sally and Jeannie were out, enjoying themselves now that Jeannie had finished her soccer practice. Both had identical bikes given to them two Christmases before, though Sally was a little too big for hers, having grown at least four inches in the last year. Nobody could outride Jeannie McFarlane. She rode like the wind. There was a joy she found in bicycle riding, a freedom from the world around her, from her parents' divorce, from homework, even, it seemed, from gravity itself. While Sally ached to be 16 so she could get a driver's license and go out with boys, Jeannie didn't care if her 16th birthday never arrived. No car could equal the power she felt when pumping the pedals and feeling the air blow through her hair, and no kiss from a boy could match the way a steep hill made her heart race. On Main Street, they hit the gas station to buy an ice cream, walking their bikes as they ate them. They stopped in front of the new dentist's office. There were four cars in the parking lot, and at least two of those had belonged to employees. Not exactly doing Walmart business. Sally commented, dripping a bit of vanilla ice cream onto her pants and wiping at it. Maybe it's the name. What? Nobody's coming because he's got a silly name. Who would want to open wide for Dr. Plowman? (laughs) I would if he was cute. (laughs) Sally said with a smile. A cute dentist? Jeannie wrinkled her nose over dramatically, as if the two were mutually exclusive. There could be a cute dentist. Sally insisted. I saw on days one time that... Uh Uh-oh, here it comes. Sally had been boy crazy for a year now, but Jeannie was still discovering them and was hesitant about some things, unsure about others. How could a dentist fall in love with you? Jeannie asked. He's rooting around in a hot, sweaty mouth. Sweaty? Okay, stinky then. Finding pieces of food, filling cavities, sticking in needles, that stuff is just gross. But not to a dentist, Sally said. Besides, I have beautiful teeth. A minute later, Mrs. Herbert, who was married to McKay's only blind guy, came out of the post office and drove off in the third of the three cars. Wow, Jeannie said. And then there were two. I feel sort of bad for them. Like when that video store opened by the Van Claren's house and nobody went. I went. But you didn't rent anything. True, Jeannie admitted. Maybe it's hard to get people to go to a new dentist, Sally said. She had eaten her ice cream too fast and had a bit of a headache. Because they trust their old one, you mean? Yeah. My mom drives us to Miller's to visit the dentist. She schedules us all on the same day, and it takes, like, five hours to see us all. I haven't been to the dentist since, like, I was 11, Jeannie said. He said I'd probably need braces soon, so I made sure I missed my last appointment. Mom never rescheduled. Good thinking. Sally said, though she did think her friend's front teeth were more crooked than they used to be. They mounted their bikes and sped off, trying to remember the lyrics to the end credit song from the new Tom Cruise movie. The sun was out bright the next day, and they decided to put out two blankets on Jeannie's lawn and see if they could get a head start on their summer tans. Sally, wearing a neon green two-piece, was stretched out facing the street, occasionally glancing up to see if the passing drivers were boys, and if they were, if they cast a look in her direction. Jeannie had on shorts and a sleeveless t-shirt. She didn't think a lot of guys with driver's licenses would be all that interested in the bodies of a 13- and a 12-year-old. And wasn't that a little creepy if they were, but it felt good to lay out and she didn't complain. I found something out about Dr. Plowman, Sally said when the radio they were listening to went to commercials. What? I guess he's really cool or something. Really? How do you know? You remember my Aunt Melody, the one who plays the organ in church? Sure. She went in a week or so back. I heard her raving to my mom about her service. Raving? It means going on and on. I know what raving means. I was just trying to imagine that. Oh, it's just as hard for me. My Aunt Melody is the most quiet, bored person you'd ever know. She didn't act that excited when Uncle Tony won that trip to New Orleans. Plowman must be a pretty great dentist, huh? She asked, smiling in spite of herself because of the name. That's another weird thing. Her teeth looked the same as before. 
She had this tiny little brown mark on her front ones from drinking tea or something, and it was still there. Weird. It was weird. No big deal, though. The radio started to play an old Madonna song, and it was time for them to turn over and give their backs some sun. Jeannie suggested they play a game where a bunch of Libyan terrorists took people from their class as hostage, and they had to choose who got shot. Tasha Griffin or Maria Espindola? Maria Espindola. Sally said almost instantly. Not because I'm a racist or anything, because she got me out in dodgeball the last week of school. Jeannie could understand that. Okay, your turn. Sally thought about it. Teddy Anderton or Willie Eaton? You know, Teddy is a little bit of a nerd, but I kind of like him. Willie Eaton. The next time the girls rode down Main Street, they stopped again in front of the dentist's office. Not because they planned to, but because they were so surprised by what they saw. The entire parking lot was full. Someone was even parked in the handicapped spot, though without a placard or decal on their license plate, Jeannie observed. Wow, what's going on here? She asked. Maybe they're painting new lines at the post office? But no, the post office was fine. So was the hair salon. All these cars had to be for the dentist. Maybe they're giving away free fillings. Jeannie guessed. Or that laughing gas stuff. I guess. Maybe he really is that cute. Sally said, naturally going back to that subject. With dark, curly hair? I don't think so. That doesn't explain all this business. Then what? Sally asked, but wasn't really into the conversation. She realized something, something she had been unable to put her finger on before now. Maybe he's just good at what he does. Jeannie, I was just thinking. My Aunt Melody. What about her? Sally paused before answering. I think she's changed. What do you mean? It was difficult to explain, but Sally gave it a try. Everything is exciting to her now. All sorts of stuff is interesting. I wasn't kidding before I used to hate going over to her place because she was so boring I wanted to kill myself. And now? Sally shrugged. My dad thought she might have a guy she was into at work or something, but she told us she doesn't. She just kept bugging my parents about the new dentist. She affected an over-animated grown-up voice. You should go there, Morgan. Take the kids in for a checkup. Stop by for a cleaning. So, what are you saying exactly? Jeannie asked. Then, when she got no answer... That Dr. Plowman is... what? Brainwashing his patients into thinking he does a good job? I was thinking he was a drug dealer, but your idea is better. You think your Aunt Melody is on drugs? Jeannie wondered. I guess I don't anymore. Well, let's go there and see what happens. Her friend suggested. You mean volunteer to have our teeth looked at? I thought you hated the dentist. I do, but this is for science. Actually, science had nothing to do with it, but it sounded good when people said that in movies. Don't we have to have our parents sign us up for that? Jeannie didn't know. And who will pay him? Sally asked. Doesn't it cost like a thousand dollars to get a checkup? Again, Jeannie didn't know. She shrugged. Okay, we'll just watch somebody go in, then wait till they go out and see what's up. They walked their bikes to the front of the post office and hitched them together on a stand there. McKay was a safe town without a lot of crime or vandalism, but you still couldn't leave your bike around unchained and expect it to still be there when you got back. Besides, Jeannie was constantly paranoid about losing her bike, treating it like her other best friend or something. Sally had mentioned that they were girls' bikes, and no bicycle thieves were girls, but Jeannie wasn't willing to take her chances. It was a nice, sunny summer day, not one to be cooped up in a stuffy, chemical-smelling office, but that didn't seem to dissuade dozens of McKay residents from spending their afternoons doing just that. It took a couple of tries for Sally to dare to speak to the people going in to see Dr. Plowman. One guy, a farmer and chain smoker, looked like he had a toothache in all eight of his remaining teeth. The girls let him go in, and the family after him, then turned to see a fat woman with a perm approaching them. The woman was smiling, giving Sally the push she needed. Hello, ma'am, Sally said, trying to sound mature and professional. My friend and I are doing a poll for our psychology class. Can we ask you a question? For what class? The woman asked, either because of the name or because it was the middle of June, or both. We're in summer school, Jeannie offered. Ah, the woman said, glancing toward Dr. Plowman's door, then back at Sally. 
Ask away, hon. Sally pretended to be remembering the exact wording. Um, what brings you to the dentist today? I have a crown, and it needs to be replaced. A bit of it just broke off a few days ago. She seemed to think that was a shocking revelation because she blushed and put her hand over her mouth. Is that what you need? Sally nodded. And have you seen Dr. Plowman before? She tossed Jeannie a look. <laughs> Dr. Plowman. No, I usually go to Praiseden. So, what changed your mind? Oh, McKay is much closer, and my sister-in-law recommended him. Right. Sally said. Thank you. Oh, no. The woman said, which was Midwestern for your welcome or no problem. Thanks. Jeannie called as the woman entered the office. The door was only open long enough for the girls to see that it was standing room only in there. Sally and Jeannie paced on the sidewalk, talking about bicycles and romantic songs until the fat woman came out again. It didn't take long considering the crowd. Perhaps the doctor considered a broken crown an emergency. The woman didn't even glance in their direction, just headed toward her car. Jeannie had to jog out beside her before she stopped. Oh, hello, girls. She was still smiling. If anything, the smile was wider now than before. How was the visit? What? The fat woman got a dreamy look in her eyes, as if remembering her first date. It made her look twenty years younger. She actually sighed. Oh, it was wonderful. The best dental appointment of my life. That sounded just like Aunt Melody. You weren't in there that long, said Jeannie, her suspicions growing. Dr. Plowman is a fast worker, the fat woman said. Can I see his work? Sally asked. Excuse me? It's for my class. I have to ask. The woman opened her mouth for the briefest of seconds. Less than a second, actually. Her mouth clapped close and went back to that dreamy grin. There hadn't been enough time to even see the affected tooth, much less check the quality of the crown. Sally was going to ask for another look, but the woman said, I can't recommend him more. Tell your mothers. And took off toward her car, like she couldn't wait to spread the word herself. They watched her go. So now what do we do? Jeannie asked a minute later. An old man left the office and walked right past them, smiling dazedly. He looked like it was rice pudding day at the rest home. I don't know. Talk to other people, I guess. The smiles they'd been seeing were all the expressions of people getting out of a musical or self-help seminar, not a sterile place of needles, drills, and gauze. You think any of them will say anything different? Jeannie wondered. Sally shrugged. I didn't think to ask to see her crown before she went in. Not that a lot of people want to show a couple of kids their cavity. Right. <laughs> the sound of crying turned them both around. A lady with two young children was walking briskly toward the office. One of the boys walked ahead of her, pouting, a few degrees shy of a tantrum. The other was being pulled along, practically dragged by his mother. He was crying big tears, coughing out, No needles, Mommy! in a pleading voice designed to break the heart. The lady looked surprisingly patient about it all, even offering the girls a cheerful nod as she passed them. I'm doing a report for my class, Sally said, falling into step with the mother. May I ask what brings you to the dentist's office today? Jeannie expected a sarcastic answer. It's famous salad bar, what do you think? But the lady, not hesitating, said, Checkups. And how did you hear about Dr. Plowman? <laughs> please, Mommy! <laughs> the crying boy begged. I'll be good, please! And now the lady did stop, scooping her son into her arms. Adam, don't make a fuss. She said, her voice as sweet as Bambi or Dumbo's mother. If you're brave, I'll buy you a hamburger. The boy shook his head, afraid beyond reasoning. Jeannie sort of knew how he felt. The pouting son, a year or two older than Adam, perked up. If I'm brave, can I have a hamburger? Sure, Eric. She said pleasantly. A cheeseburger? He persisted. Sure. The mother said and began back toward the door. Then she stopped and looked back at Sally. Oh, Dr. Plowman filled a cavity for me 11 days ago. He's very professional. Tell your parents. Then she turned back to the door and shifted the squirming Adam to pull it open. He was making a disturbing mewling sound that made Jeannie want to cover her ears. Adam? They heard the lady say. Stop that display. There's nothing to be scared of. 
As the trio entered the busy office, Jeannie was convinced that he was right to be afraid. The girls waited an hour, making more small talk and trying to stay positive, before the mother and her boys came out again. In that time, at least a dozen more patients showed up, although not all of them may have had appointments with Dr. Plowman. One of them stopped to chat with the girls before going in. It was Kyle Flickinger, a boy from their junior high. Hey, Jeannie, he said, walking up, carrying himself like a grown man. Sally? Sally paused a moment, remembering how to breathe, then said, Hey, hey, Kyle. Though his last name was just as odd as Plowman, the girls had never made fun of it. Kyle was handsome, lean, and muscular. Sally would have said he looked a bit like James Dean had she known who he was. What's going on, Kyle? He moped, suddenly looking his age. I've got to get a stupid checkup. Alone? Sally asked. Kyle hesitated. Well, my mom dropped me off while she went to praise him for groceries. What are you two doing here? We rode our bikes, Sally said, lifting one of her bare legs so he could appreciate it, or at least notice. At that moment, the office door opened and the lady with the two boys came out. She no longer held the crying boy, and he was no longer crying. Instead, he had a light, serene look on his face, like a sleeper in the midst of his sweetest dream. The other boy had a similar look, quite a change from the pout he'd sported before. Their mother looked the same way, but then she always had. How was the checkup, kids? Jeannie asked, a little hesitant to hear the answer. Fine. Fine. Both boys said at the same time, and smiled. You should try it, the boy who had pouted added. He was like a kid on a cereal commercial. Did you... Jeannie began, then her throat tightened and she had to start again. Are you going to get your cheeseburger? No, thank you, the boy answered, but she hadn't been offering. The boy reached up and took his mother's hand in what appeared to Jeannie a very poor imitation of childhood innocence. She didn't think it was drugs anymore. As the happy family walked off, Kyle Flickinger said, Are they your neighbors or something? Kyle, Jeannie said, grabbing at him. Don't go in. Huh? (laughs) He chuckled but it was an unsure sound. Just don't. The doctor is a jerk. Well, so is my dad, Kyle said, and started in the direction of the office. Sally spoke up quickly. I'll kiss you if you don't go in. Kyle stopped. What? You heard her, Jeannie added. Kyle made an unattractive dismissing sound and began back (sighs) toward the dentist. French, Sally said at once. Kyle stopped again, slowly turning. He walked back up to them, his face beginning to turn red. Are you kidding? Just a little one, Sally said, already crimson herself. I don't get it, Kyle said, looking at Jeannie for an explanation. Jeannie thought hard. Kyle was pretty cute, and nobody deserved to get brainwashed. It's important, was all she was able to come up with. Kyle looked back at Sally again. I'll ditch my appointment he said, an embarrassed little grin on his face. If she'll French kiss me. What? What? Both Sally and Jeannie said at the same time. The boy's face flushed big time, his cheeks as red as an overripe plum. His shoelaces were suddenly very interesting. Uh, I gotta go sign in. Jeannie took a step toward him, a brook trout flopping around in her stomach. Okay. She said. Kyle grinned again, but it was weaker, more hesitant. Jeannie, I... Shut up. She mumbled. She grabbed hold of his shoulders and pulled him into her. It was about right, since she was an inch or so taller than him. She had never been this close to a boy before. She could smell his skin, his breath, and the baseball cap smell of his hair. She wasn't really sure how it was supposed to work. Sally claimed to have kissed a boy before, but Jeannie hadn't even come close. But as soon as their noses weren't touching anymore, it felt quite natural. His lips pressed pretty hard at first, then parted. Well, here goes, she thought, and did the Marco Polo thing. As strange as it felt in her mouth, it was even stranger in the base of her stomach, a sensation not unlike coasting down a steep hill on her bicycle. Kyle really started getting into it, and Jeannie got the feeling he could do this all afternoon and well into the night. She broke away, taking a few unbalanced steps toward Sally. Kyle's grin was back, all teeth and squinting brown eyes. 
He looked like a used car salesman. I uh, have a baseball game on Saturday. I could probably skip too, he said to Jeannie. All right, all right, Sally said, suddenly angry at him. Go on home, James Bond. Kyle seemed to like that too. He started back the way he came, then turned around in the parking lot and bowed to the girls. He actually bowed. I think I hate him, Sally whispered. Jeannie didn't make a sound. It took a few seconds for Sally to rein her jealousy in. When she had done so, she turned to her friend and asked, Well, how was it? Weird, Jeannie said without thinking. I think he was drinking Mountain Dew earlier. No new customers slash patients slash victims were showing up. Jeannie saw the stern-faced receptionist come to the door and switch the open sign to close. Soon there were six cars in the lot, then four, then two, a Mazda and a convertible. A long moment later, the stern-faced receptionist herself came out of the office, approached her car, and used her key fob to disarm the alarm system before she got in. As she drove off, it gave Sally an idea. Only one car was left, and it was full dark now. The girls figured that car belonged to the good doctor himself. They psyched each other up until Jeannie was ready. They shared a nod, then parted ways. Jeannie snuck over to the bushes in front of the dental practice, hunkering down where she wouldn't be seen. A moment later, Sally, astride her bicycle, came zooming through the parking lot, angling as close as possible to the convertible. As she sped past, she gave it a kick with one of her tennis shoes. Sure enough, its alarm began blaring, and Sally rode on down the block, not looking back. A moment after that, a man came storming out of the dentist's office, pushing through the door and heading to investigate his car. In the second before the door swung shut, Jeannie darted from behind the bushes and into the office. By the time the alarm had been silenced and the doctor returned to the building, Jeannie was hiding under the receptionist's desk, waiting for the right time to make her move. She huddled there, thinking all sorts of scared thoughts, imagining the worst possible outcomes to this crazy situation. But it was too late to turn back now, no matter how wildly her heart was beating in her chest. Almost a half an hour, she stayed crouched down, her knees starting to ache, her mind starting to wander, her bladder starting to irritate her. And then she saw the office light shut off at the end of the hall and she heard the doctor walking out, flipping light switches as he went. What kind of doctor stayed longer than his employees? Jeannie was bathed in darkness as the man left through the front door and heard a jangling of keys as he locked it from the outside. She stayed where she was until she heard a car engine start and a minute more after that. Then she stood and walked through the dark, inch by inch, around the reception desk and through the waiting room until she came to the front door. She looked out until she saw Sally pull up on her bicycle and park it in the bushes next to Jeannie's. She unlocked the door for Sally and let her inside. Jeannie felt like hugging her friend when they were together again. She hadn't enjoyed being alone, not even for 30 minutes, and it occurred to her what a valuable thing a best friend was, someone you could tell about wanting Ray Morgan to love you in the sixth grade, about when you said the F word in front of your grandma, about the embarrassment of your first period. Heck, maybe she would hug her when this was all over. For a minute there, I was afraid you weren't coming back. Jeannie confessed locking the door again behind them. Well, you did make out with my boyfriend, Sally said with a flip of her hair. Could you blame me? My boyfriend now, Jeannie replied with a devilish grin. Once she said it, though, she couldn't help but wonder if it might not be true or come true in the future. Once again, she felt that little tickle in the base of her stomach. God, where was that feeling when she was under the receptionist's desk, her knees knocking and a thousand horror movie scenarios playing in her head? We'll see, Sally said, and maybe a bit of the humor was gone from her voice. It didn't matter now. They had more important fish to fry. So what do we do? I don't know, admitted Sally. Let's look around and see what's what. So they did. Since none of the windows faced Main Street, they didn't worry about drawing attention to themselves and turned on the light in the hall. There were four doors there. Two were exam rooms, one was a supply closet, and one a restroom. They checked the closet first. It was empty. It had several shelves and a pair of cabinets, but nothing was in them. At the end of the hall was a big machine that looked like it took x-rays. A box of rubber gloves was sitting on it, and a broom leaned against it. All standard, boring stuff. 
They moved on to the first exam room. It was a small space with a dentist chair, a handy adjustable lamp, a tray, a garbage can, a bank of cabinets, a sink, and a counter. Sally checked in each of the cabinets and found them empty as well. Nothing wrong here, Sally said, obviously disappointed. Wait, Jeannie said. There's something wrong. Sally couldn't see what it was. This is a working dentist's office, right? Jeannie asked. Yeah. And we know he had patients, right? Right. Sally said, still not getting it. Then where's the equipment? The drills and sharp poker things? The filling material and that gross pink goop they make retainers with? Where's the sucker tube they put in your mouth to catch all the drool and blood? Where's the bibs with the cold metal chains they make you wear? I don't know. Sally understood where she was going with this. Let's check the drawers. They couldn't check the drawers, though, because they didn't open. They were a part of the counter, the kind of drawers that came with a bathroom set and were just for show. Sally and Jeannie went back into the hall and checked the bathroom. Nothing unusual there. The toilet worked, at least. They looked at the remaining door, closed at the end of the hall, both girls feeling trepidatious about opening it. What if it's a portal to another dimension? Jeannie asked as they stepped toward the door. I don't know. I guess that would be cool to see. Sally didn't believe in portals to other dimensions, though. She took a different tack. What if it's an empty room? When they opened the door and turned on the light, they didn't find an empty room or an extra-dimensional portal. They found another exam room. It was the same as the first, except this one was bigger and had a tall, portable supply cabinet in the corner. There was another chair, another sink, another garbage can, another lamp, and a portable stand where a doctor would put his tools sitting by the door. On this stand was a bottle of spick and span and a roll of paper towels. Jeannie started toward the big cabinet, then changed her mind and checked the drawers. They didn't open either. Sally was standing by the chair, looking intently everywhere but at the cabinet in the corner. Jeannie stepped away from the counter, then stopped. There was something in the sink over the drain. It was the remnants of a paper towel, a blood-stained paper towel. Jeannie made her way to the side of the counter where the garbage can stood. She forced herself to look inside. It was half filled with soiled paper towels, all similarly stained with blood. She stepped away from it. Okay, I'll check it, Sally said from the corner of the room, standing in front of the cabinet, psyching herself up. Sally, Jeannie began, wanting to be anywhere but here, and fast. Sally stepped away from the cabinet as if she'd been waiting for an excuse not to open it. What? Maybe we shouldn't look, Jeannie said, and the quaver in her voice made her even more scared than she had been before. Maybe we should just go. Sally nodded, thinking of that Greek myth about the girl who opened the box of evil. Maybe. Maybe we can talk to the sheriff and have him check this place out. What would we tell him? The truth? Sally said. That there's something really bad going on in this office. He wouldn't believe us. They never do. Then we leave an anonymous message. Call 911 and don't leave our names. It would sound like a prank then. They wouldn't check it out. Sally got another idea. Then we lie. We'll say we heard screaming in here at night and saw him drag a little kid in here or something. Jeannie nodded. That could work, actually. It was much better than the dentist is doing a brainwashing operation during office hours. But wait. What if the sheriff's already been here? She made a circle with her arm. You know. Sally swallowed. That was a good question. Too good. Okay, screw this. She said at last, and yanked open the cabinet's doors. She and Jeannie looked inside, not sure what it was they were looking at. There were several of them, whatever they were, each in a tiny glass bubble or beaker, in a huge network of what had to be hundreds of bubbles. Some of the tubules were empty, but most were not. The ones that weren't had dark things in them, things that looked part liquid and part solid, like leeches or jello. Black, shiny stuff. Things so black they seemed to be blue. Actually, what they most looked like to Jeannie were gummy bears. If you chewed up a bunch and rolled a ball of them in your palm, if they made black gummy bears, that was. The dark things were moving, pulsating, wriggling. They were alive. Sally looked away from them. A phrase from a scary movie came to her mind. 
of unknown origin. She looked back. Alive. Alien. Evil, somehow. What are they, Jeannie? Jeannie opened her mouth to say she didn't know, but she couldn't get a sound out. These objects were horrible, vile, unnatural. It hurt her eyes to look at them. I call them placidators, a voice said behind them. Sally gasped and Jeannie uttered a little squeak. (gasps) They spun around. Dr. Plowman was standing in the doorway, watching them. He was indeed a handsome man, forty-ish, in good shape, fairly tall, with perfect blonde brown hair and turquoise eyes. Movie star Mel Gibson eyes, but cold. There was silence for a moment as the girls digested exactly how much trouble they were in. Jeannie actually felt the blood drain from her face. Sally realized it was up to her. She didn't know what to do, but decided to try what worked on boys her age. She made eye contact with him. It took considerable effort, but she managed to force her mouth into an interested smile. Um, hello, she said and raised her brows in a pseudo-sexy way. Dr. Plowman returned the eye contact. A little late for an appointment, don't you think? He asked, apparently immune to her charm. Sally didn't know how to respond to that. She couldn't see a way out of this. We... She looked over at her friend. Jeannie was in even worse shape. Tears had gathered in her eyes. We're we're just... As Sally's voice faltered, Jeannie began to cry in earnest. (laughs) She couldn't help herself. Calm down. You're not in trouble, Plowman said. I'm a nice man. Ask anyone. Sally thought of something to say. What's a placidator? The smile on the dentist's face remained, but it was gone from his eyes. Why don't you get in the chair? I'll show you. That shut Sally up again. The man took a couple of steps toward the cabinet. Instinctively, the girls took a couple of steps away from it. They're alive, you know, the dentist said, glancing over at the dark object. Very beautiful. They're not beautiful, Jeannie managed to say. They'd fall on the opposite end of the scale from beautiful. The man looked back at her, slightly offended. You don't know what you're talking about. What are they? Sally asked. Have you ever heard of the little birds in Africa that live on hippopotamuses or alligators? They sit atop them, offering their assistance, sharing their existence. Plowman smiled again. Whether it was because he had said those words so many times before or because he unconsciously made a rhyme, the girls didn't catch. The birds maintain them picking off the insects that irritate the larger animal's eyes or nose. They're symbiotes, partners, just one more wonder of nature. He glanced back at the placidators, and a look of love, almost of awe, came over him. These do something very similar. But the larger animals in question are us. Jeannie thought she knew where this was going. Maybe not specifically, but generally. And she wanted to get out of there. So good, so generous, he said, barely tearing his eyes away from the glass tubules to make sure the girls weren't trying to escape. These noble little beings attach themselves to a human partner, via the thing that hangs at the back of the throat. The uvula. Jeannie surprised herself by knowing. Very good, young lady. The uvula. It's subtle, barely invasive, hardly noticeable. And you get to be part of something unique. And wondrous. Does it hurt? Jeannie whispered. Dr. Plowman shrugged. Yes, it's, it's a little painful, but you'll find when you're older that practically anything worthwhile is. You know, I think I'll pass. Sally heard herself saying and couldn't believe it was her own voice, sounding so brave and in control. Jeannie stared at her, impressed. I'm afraid you're outvoted on this one. Dr. Plowman said, that same half-smile on his face. But I admire your attempt at humor, even when you're afraid. Thank you, she whispered, the best she could do under the circumstances. Levity is one of the traits they most admire about us, Plowman said. They find it endlessly fascinating. He seemed to muse for a moment. I never had much of a funny bone growing up. But you might be able to teach them a thing or two about humor. If they want humor, they can just turn on Seinfeld, Sally said. But this one fell flat, even in her own ears. 
She was afraid, terribly so. Plowman's smile grew a bit at that, but it was still not a real smile. His only real one had been when he looked at his menagerie of black slugs. Let's get this over with, all right? He took a step forward, still appearing quite calm. You two are lucky, he offered. There are only a few young people who have undergone the procedure. You'll be in very good company. The mayor, the sheriff, the elementary school principal, two of your teachers, the... Which ones? Sally wanted to know. It doesn't matter. They'll all be soon. He returned to his mental list, boasting. The town select woman, the fire chief, crossing guard, the lady postmaster next door, and the old veterinarian. Mm -hmm. An involuntary whimper issued from Jeannie. Not Doc Naidu. She loved him. Everyone loved him. The semi-retired vet had bent over backward to save the life of her Siamese cat the previous fall, actually making her believe, for a little while anyway, in miracles. Many... Many people. And now, two more. He took another step toward her, and there came an aberrant gurgle in the back of his throat. It sounded like a death rattle. Terror overcoming her, Jeannie could only press herself harder against the wall as the man approached them. But at the last moment, Sally moved past him and grabbed the tray off the cart beside the dentist's chair, intending to hit him with it. He appraised her without concern. There was not much Sally could do to a big man like that. But she thought there was something. She changed her grip on the tray, and instead of hitting Dr. Plowman with it, she threw it with all her might at the open cabinet. There was a moment, almost comical, when Plowman snorted at her poor throwing ability. Then the tray hit the case. Glass shattered as several alien bottles were broken by the impact of the tray, and the floor was covered with shards and writhing black forms. Dr. Plowman gaped in horror, freezing like a deer caught in the headlights. In that moment, Sally ran for the door, wrenched it open, and shot out through it. Jeannie had farther to go, and felt blinding pain in the back of her head as the man's fist closed around her ponytail, yanking her away from the door and freedom. Sally jarred her wrist painfully against the front door of the clinic, realizing it opened inward rather than out. She glanced behind her, expecting to see the crazed dentist barreling toward her from the end of the hall, but she was alone. She despaired that Jeannie hadn't made it out, but only for a moment. She had to go to someone who would help her friend before Plowman could do something to her. But who? She couldn't go to the authorities now. The sheriff and his deputies had already been given placidators. But she could make someone believe her. Tears rolled down her cheeks as she yanked her bicycle from where it lay in the bushes beside the post office, riding off as fast as her legs would take her. Dr. Plowman let go of Jeannie's hair, setting a restraining hand on her thin shoulder as he used the other to close the door again. He released her and slowly pivoted the face of the cabinet. He stood rooted to the spot, looking from the broken incubators to the wriggling creatures on the floor and back. The placidators outside of their containers seemed to be dying. Some were making a light gurgling like spaghetti caught in a drain. Some were already dead. Jeannie looked away from them, hating herself for her slowness. Finally, the dentist turned back to her, running his hands over his face like a son who knows a beating is coming. Well? He sighed. Apparently, he was aware of the impending punishment, but he recognized that he couldn't do anything about it now. Jeannie's breath hitched in her chest, doing all she could not to curl into a weeping ball in the corner. What's your name? The man asked, with the gentleness and soft tones of a child psychologist, or maybe a dentist used to dealing with children. Jeannie said nothing. It wasn't that she didn't want to tell him so much as she was too afraid to speak. I won't bite, he said, still soft and good-natured. What is your name? Jeannie, she said at last. That's a nice name. Short for Virginia? Jeannie shook her head. A second later, she whispered, Long for Jean. I'm sorry I pulled your hair, Jeannie, Dr. Plowman said, not moving from where he stood. If he was expecting her to tell him that it was okay, he was in for a long wait. His face was troubled. Whether it was sincere or all an act, she couldn't tell. You look so scared, Jeannie. Don't be. I understand what you're feeling right now. I, I really do. He smiled and took a step forward. Less than a step, actually. More like half a step. I was afraid, too. And it was worse for me because 
I was one of the first. I didn't have anyone to tell me that there was nothing to be scared of. Jeannie thought of that little boy struggling against his brainwashed mother, terrified to go inside and be corrupted as she had been. He'd had the right idea. But it's nice, Plowman continued. Nice and tranquil and so uncluttered, if you know what I'm saying. It's like going from adulthood back to childhood again. And he smiled then. It seemed like a genuine expression, with no dishonesty, no malice, no evil in it. And that made it all the worse somehow, to know that he really believed everything he was saying. Something occurred to the man, something nice. Or going from one of the losers of this world to one of the winners. This comment disturbed Jeannie more than anything he had said previously. Perhaps it was due to that smile, or perhaps because he said this world instead of the world. Did that mean that there were other worlds out there, and he was from one of them? Or at least a part of him was? Jeannie was also shaken by the meaning behind the dentist's offer. She had heard adults talk about growing up and Peter Pan syndrome, and how dull and stifling adulthood was. But they must have forgotten that a child wants to grow up, to be bigger and better, to know what the grown-ups know. She shook her head. I don't want to go from adulthood to childhood. She thought. I want to grow up just like everybody else does. Or better yet, get a chance to stay a child just a little longer. After all, except for the occasional brush with killer dentists and French kisses with cute boys, her lifestyle was very much like a kid's. And what was wrong with that? It's like a sick child who's afraid to take his medicine, Dr. Plowman was saying, still calm, still unconcerned. He only knows it tastes bad, not that it will lift his fever or help his body fight the illness. Jeannie was ignoring the man now. I kissed a boy today, she thought. My mom would want to hear about that. And she suddenly began to feel angry at this man. A first kiss is a big deal. Sally and I should talk about it all night. I should get a chance to write about it in my diary. Her hands became clenched little fists by her side. This stupid dentist doesn't want me to do that. She shook her head and decided to take this moment to turn around and run. Why she hadn't made it the first time, she didn't know. She had been too scared, she supposed, too shocked. But not anymore. Now she was angry. And she wasn't about to play the sniveling girl while this idiot lobotomized her. What will happen to the broken ones? She asked, looking over at the damaged bottles in the cabinet. Dr. Plowman glanced behind him, a line of disappointment appearing on his forehead. Unfortunately, he said, those that have... And Jeannie went for it. She turned around and headed full throttle toward the office door. As she wrenched it open, she heard the dentist's nice shoes hitting the linoleum floor. He was after her. She disappeared out of the door and down the hall, aware that he was probably only a few feet behind her. She ran as fast as she could, her legs tight and hard from hours of bicycling, past the reception desk and into the waiting room. As soon as she got through that door, she would be free. The hand gripped the knob and turned it. The door pulled inward rather than pushing outward, and it was as she was pulling open the door that he caught her. His left hand grabbed her arm while his right dropped onto her shoulder, the fingers digging in so hard she drew a sharp breath through clenched teeth. He pushed her up against the door, using her body to force it closed. No more gentleness in his movements, no more calming words from his lips. Get back there right now, he whispered, or I'll break one of your fingers. He gave her a shove toward the hall, following along behind her, blocking her exit. Jeannie shuffled toward the office, adrenaline coursing through her veins. She was trying to think of another option, maybe the window? She entered the office, smelling a wet odor coming from the broken containers that for some reason reminded her of seafood. The window was the kind that slid upward, and even better, there were bars on it. Great. What else could she try? Dr. Plowman stood by the door again and stayed there. Where were we? He asked. Jeannie didn't answer. She realized Sally was probably on her way back with help right now. Maybe parents, maybe police. Too bad neither girl had big, angry brothers with aluminum baseball bats. But she had only to wait this out. Tell me more about the Placidos, she said. No more talk, Plowman said. Nobody's coming for you. 
you'll find that people find unpleasant news much harder to swallow than good news. She won't be believed. Jeannie didn't know if that was true or not, but he seemed to think so. And they're called placidators, the dentist added. Get in the chair, please. She got up on the black leather chair, wondering how many others had sat there before her without realizing something was wrong. Very well, he said. The tone of his voice made her think he had won. Hot tears moved down Jeannie's face, tickling her ears and soaking into her hair. I'm going to turn on the light now, Jeannie, Plowman said, the gentleness coming back into his voice. Just go with it. Think of this as just another checkup. I don't want to be one of you, Jeannie whispered. Dr. Plowman moved toward her, still between her and the door. He leaned in so close she thought he might kiss her. Wow, two in one day. But he didn't. He looked earnest and compassionate. I didn't either, he said. Then he flipped a switch on the lamp and a soft pink glow issued from it, a womb-like warmth Jeannie couldn't turn away from. She felt sleepy looking at the light, and her eyes squeezed out fresh tears as they went closed. Only ten minutes passed before Jeannie left the clinic. Dr. Plowman let her out and locked the door behind him. He disappeared back down the hall to clean up. He had quite a job ahead of him. But so did she. It was a lot of responsibility for such a young girl to track down Sally Riddick, gather anyone she may have influenced, and mark anyone she may have spoken to. But she was up to it. In the bushes in front of the post office, Jeannie's bike was still waiting. But she left her bicycle where it was and walked on toward Sally's house. She didn't need it anymore. It was a child's toy. There were more important things in this world to focus on, to think about. Important things outside this world, too. Welcome back. I hope you guys enjoyed the story. Author's note. Author's hey. author's note. Are we going to do an author's no, note? No, no author's note. What, what, what do we do after the story? Uh, the feedback. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> that was disastrous. It oh. ended the show for a while. <laughs> uh, I, I was thinking more of a cast list. Oh, okay, a cast list. Yeah, let's go ahead and do a cast list. And while we're doing the cast list, why don't we uh, hand the cast a mic and we're going to pass it around and say who was who. And then you can say, hi, everybody, to the folks out there. How does that sound? First of all, our narrator extraordinaire was Brian Lincoln. Hello. All right. You're going to have to help me remember who played what. Maybe I should just say... Uh, Jeannie. Jeannie was... Okay, Jeannie. Jeannie was a good character. Very important. Placidated. Uh, Jeannie was played by Renee Chambliss. Hello. First live reading. Yeah. Pretty cool. Okay. The, what was the other girl's name? S Sally. I Sally. Think. Okay. Sally was played by... Are you asking me? <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was El Scribe Harris. Yes. It's been Clearly I'm not important to Big at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> I knew Rish loved me better. <laughs> that girl, that person... From that podcast over there in the corner that cries. Sorry, I lost my train of thought when I was talking. <laughs> <laughs> it happens to be often, unfortunately. Okay, sorry. Sally was played by L. Scribe Harris. Hello. Okay. Uh, he was distracted by the midget that just wandered through the room. <laughs> room. She had a great rack, though. What other characters were there? Just, uh, you can say Dr. Plowman. Okay, Dr. Plowman was played by Marshall Latham. Hello there. All right. And I don't remember, was it Fat Lady from Fat Midwestern Lady and... Yeah, Abby played two minor characters and also Brian played one of the children. Oh, that's right. Right? right? Hello? Yeah, Brian played a five, a six-year-old... Well, it was never established how young. Oh, we don't know how old the children were. And then I did the voice of the other child. Oh, wait, did you do something? Uh, you, I was, Kyle Oh, that's right, I was Kyle Flickinger. <laughs> Just drank some. Ma I'd actually had had Mountain Dew. Of Mountain Dew. <laughs> mm. And shattered dreams. So that was our cast list, and that is our cast of this post-show story chat as well. 
So, Rish Outfield, who wrote the story and didn't provide an author's note. I never do. <laughs> can't tell us a little bit about the story, and uh, we'll go from there, I guess. This was a story I wrote several years ago, hence the Tom Cruise reference uh, in there. I, I think it was supposed to take place in, like, 1991. And Mel Gibson reference, I, too. So, hence, there were no cell phones. Uh, yeah, and Mel Gibson. Uh, that's a, both that's a despised dated, people now. Yeah, people that we didn't realize were crazy yet. That was a dated... Reference, I suppose, but I, I just I, I liked I, in lots of my stories I use Tom Cruise because his career has lasted so long, and you know he 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 was at least a sex symbol for a long long time. You're Tom Cruise crazy. Hey, <laughs> hey, thank you, Marshall. <clears throat> yes, a little bit. I mean, I, when he got the teeth fixed, and so yes, this is a story I wrote a few years ago, and I think it was initially longer, and there was a lot more about bicycle riding. And I submitted it to a, a fiction market like two years ago, and they accepted it. They said that they liked it, even though it was that it was long. And you know, if I could shave a tiny bit off, I think they just wanted it to be under a set number of words. And so I, I shaved it, and like I said, I, I pulled out a little bit about bicycle riding, I think, and and then they accepted it, and then they went under. <laughs> so I never got that published, and. When I heard that there was the opportunity for us to do a live reading, I thought, oh, that would be really good because we found out at the New Media Expo that there are very few female podcasters. And yet we have three of them in the room, four if you count me, in the room <laughs> with us. And so I thought, what kind of story do I have that has a lot of, of female characters in it? And so I picked this one and, uh, and I just hoped that everybody would be okay with it. Yeah, we got two main characters. And we read it aloud, all in a group, and then and everybody is still here. And so, I mean, I hoped that it was entertaining. And, uh, you know, we also read one of uh, Scribe's stories. And I don't know if it was excruciating for you to be in the room, but like every single line where I thought maybe I should have changed that or, oh, you know, maybe the story is going on too long. Or every time somebody stumbled over a line, I thought, oh, maybe it was because of my writing... It's kind of it was hard to it, be in the room. It was kind of hard to be in the room. It was also really interesting when stuff went really well or better than I expected. I mean, you you guys saw me do the whole squee it was awesome when finally a scene <laughs> came out and it was so good and I was really excited. But then I felt just so bad for Big because I didn't I know I describe things a lot and have a a lot of narration in comparison to the amount of dialogue I have, but Big had gone on for like 5 minutes. And then Brian said, like, two lines, <laughs> another <laughs> 10 minutes of big talking. And I was like, oh, yeah, maybe so. And I was, it, it was excruciating to say, oh, is that comma misplaced? Oh, you can take out that description right there. It's not really necessary. <laughs> yeah, it was late at night, too, which always is harder. Um, there was a time when we used to do the show where it was like there was a certain time where we were just like, oh, no, when we hit this time. You know, it, we can't do anything anymore because it's just too late for us to do anything uh, of worth. And it was getting pretty late towards that time. I was the narrator of this story, by the way. This is the story that you didn't hear uh, <laughs> we're talking about now. Um, but yeah, we did a, a story of scribes that I narrated. Rish was a character. Brian was a character. And Abby did get two or, or one. I guess it's one line with a little with a tag thrown in the middle of it. I can feel my fever rising. So. Oh, no. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Abby's you getting ill right as we did speak. I, did I give you the plague, Abby? Maybe we should take the mic away from her before she pukes all over it. I don't know how easy those I'm clean not, up. I'm not following along very well. I'm sorry. <laughs> but the advice that we always give to anybody who wants to be a podcaster, anybody who wants to be a writer, anybody who wants to live beyond tomorrow is you have to read your story aloud because it feels totally different and you will notice things that you never notice just on the page and if somebody stumbles over a line or, or it sounds awkward spoken aloud then hey that's something that you might want to change or, or it might be just the person that read it and so I yes when I hear my stuff read I do become hypercritical and I was like, oh, geez, I don't know if this is working. And, and, and having heard the story, you folks can decide whether it was good or not. But yeah, it was meant to be a scary story and it was meant to be an unhappy ending where you really feel sorry for this character. And I felt like, oh, no, it's been too light for too long. That's not going to work. 
Uh, in fact, let me ask, well, well, did it work in the end? Was, did you consider having the nasty girl killed? Or I mean, she wasn't nasty, but she was just more unfeeling. Did you consider doing her instead of the, the no. nice one? It was, yeah, it you was the nice totally, one because totally the, the sweeter mind. one, the, the, the she one... She wasn't nasty. She was just very much a... She wasn't as attached to her friend. She wouldn't. She wouldn't have come back. I. It just the the more innocent one is. I think the one you were would be more concerned with. I, but and that's just my opinion. Maybe it was wrong. But well, I just uh, you know with an unhappy ending. No, and I think that's the t- that's the point of a horror story. And part of the point of the horror story is the it's it's horrifying the person. Oh yeah, that, no, it was the right choice. I just wondered yeah. whether. You know, yeah. Yeah. No, I, that, that, that worked much better that way because she was the one that. that uh, that had more kind of a bucket list, and she got it basically right. jerked away from her as a well, young teen. And if you look at Shakespeare plays, Shakespeare plays, especially the tragedies, like let's take Romeo and Juliet, for example, the first half should be hilarious, and then the second half should suck. And that's kind of what this one, <laughs> what happened with this is the first half first was half all was... boys and bicycles, and then and it the second sucked. half was all placid dangers and fear. Yeah. And then it was just terrible, and we all wanted to kill Rish. Yeah. No, I thought it was really good. I had a good had a good theme and, and followed through to the end. I actually really liked the ending. Um, I liked the idea of one girl stalking the other at the end without having to ha- even have that in the story. You can kind of see the whole thing play out in your head. After that point, and as I really liked the visual I had of that, it kind of set up a lot more than just oh, what could happen. You could almost see like the next while of what was going to happen, and that's that's a good story that can do that. Cool, Renee. You look like you have something to say. Yeah. Well, I felt really scared doing the part at the end, um, and I thought Marshall did an awesome, creepy, <laughs> scary <laughs> doctor. I mean, um, I thought that was great. And one thing I wanted it's to ask. the quiet one. Yeah, the other actors. I mean, this might just be me and being, you know, worried and self-conscious and self-critical. But I had sort of the opposite experience of what you're talking about with the writer. You know, I wanted to do a good job because the writer was sitting right there. And often when I do voice work for people, I think the writer is who I think about because, you know, being a writer, you know how important it is to them and how much they have put into it and how much they care. And you really want to reflect their vision. So I felt a little self-conscious doing it because I just wanted to make sure that I was, you know, doing it in a way that worked for you as a writer. Well, hey, thanks for saying that. I I felt really grateful that I uh, look. How long did it take us to do? Like two hours, <laughs> including the setup and all that. And now we're still talking about it. So it's, I feel greedy. I feel like I took everybody's time. Mm-hmm. And and y'all are professional level podcasters or audio producers or actors. And so I got the best of the best to read this story. And even if it wasn't a great story, y'all again to use that weird word made it better than it would have been. You know what I mean? Somebody puts a lot of heart into it or a a lot of of emotion or, or, you know, hard work, and it elevates the material. And and I I don't think you should worry about it being too light for too long because I think that's what made it more scary at the end because I was really getting into the story and these two girls and their dreams and when when the uh, the boy came and they were je- there was the jealousy and the kiss and all that I mean that I was really getting into that story and these about these girls and the mountain dew and the mountain dew <laughs> <laughs> so then when it turned when when they went in and then the doctor came back I mean that that made it all the more scary because we cared about these girls all those little details those little touches I think invest the reader in this or the listener in the story also there's something creepy about something being attached to your you that your uvula i kind of like that idea actually (laughs) or like yeah yeah, 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 there's really something really creepy about having something attached to your ovula um (laughs) the the idea of like having trying to get people to open their mouths to like see whether they've got some horrible black thing hanging from their uvula Yeah, You've been letting your uvula go to the I dogs, Babs. Yeah, the pronunciation of uvula. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. I, I knew you would know, so <laughs> I figured if I got it wrong, you would. But thanks, Libet. Let us know. Now, I was going to say that, um, you know, we do a lot of these kinds of stories. Obviously, Dune Seep has done a ton of them. Um, and it is kind of special to not only be in a room doing a live recording, but to do it with familiar voices that you've heard so many times. It's something that, you know, as soon as I knew we would, I knew we would all be together, and it was a possibility. It was 
uh, it was a priority to try <laughs> to get together and find a way to do it because it was a lot of fun. That was uh, uh, now. Here's a question: Am I the only one that kind of weirded out in the fact that all these voices are now in the room with you? Because like you hear them all the time, but you don't hear them from a person that you can see. And then all of a sudden you're sitting there, and then you're like, oh, that's, Re- oh, "That's Renee. She's right here." Well, it's oh funny. Oh my gosh! Because, <laughs> it's funny because podcasters become sort of like characters in your head. Like yeah. when you're hearing a character from like a, a fiction novel or something, you have your own idea of what that character looks like and what they behave like, their mannerisms. And so when you actually see them in person and then suddenly that voice you know that belongs to this character of Big Anklevich <laughs> is coming out of a person that is not what you not expected, but not that you really expected anything in particular, but it's not quite what you expected. <laughs> is it nearly so handsome as Rish had led you to believe? Oh my <laughs> god. Yeah, Rish lied to me. Oh, that yeah. bastard. Rish oh, really built so... you up. <laughs> this this was the first convention that we had gone to, and, the, and so I had daddy. never met any of you, except for Abby, and I remember that day that we met Abby, uh, he, R- Big, said, hey, look over there, she is, that's Abby, and I said, no, that's, that's, that's not Abby. <laughs> um, and it just Abby's because way prettier than it, that. The, the, no, the opposite of that. It's there was an image of you in my head, even though I guess I'd seen pictures of you on Facebook, or, or maybe they weren't good pictures or something. But it's just your voice created he an thought, image in my mind. Your voice sounds like it belongs to a hag, Abby, he really is what he's me, saying. No, what he really means is he wanted me to have pointed ears and a tail. I mean, he was looking for Yeah, that's what we were looking for, pretty much. Yeah. We're like, no, she doesn't have cloven yeah, yeah. hooves. No, I'm actually, expecting a furry. <laughs> that is a interesting furry. because I have met all of you except for Renee. And Renee, to me, looks like I imagined her to, I don't know, you look exactly like my mental... Well, I have pictures of. Yes. So, so, so but uh, you guys have not met. I think you have met the fewest number of these people, and yeah. we have all been to conventions where we have met. I don't know yeah. if you have. I haven't met anyone. We've this is my met a lot. Time. It's we've several over several. She's years pointing at me. People. So you're having that experience for the first time that we all had the first time we went to Balticon, right? Dragon Con or whatever. Yeah, it was interesting, but I think it was compounded because we're actually reading a story together. It's not just like, hey, oh, we met on the street and we're just yeah. hanging out and talking. Yeah. No, now it's. It's a story that I normally just hear in my headphones, but instead I'm sitting next to the person reading it. I don't know. There's something weird about it. And it's like what Renee was saying. Normally she does her recordings, you know, under her her tent. I, I'm in the, the closet, closet now. Oh, right. okay. You've gone so normally into the Renee does come her out of the closet. Normally Renee. Renee doesn't come out of the closet for her recordings, but this we time she made an exception. And love you for who you are. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and I think one of the greatest things about getting being able to get together, even though it was strange to hear all these recognizable or familiar voices coming out of unfamiliar faces, it was really great to be able to gauge the energy in the room and to be able to feed off the energy of other people doing what they love to do, because we all do this because we love it. And um, that was just so interesting, and being able to direct each other on the spot was really cool. And um, yeah. and just see what everybody else was capable of doing because we had some pretty varied roles between the two stories we recorded. Right. I really appreciated that the 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 vibe of being in the room and having an immediate reaction when something was funny or when something was ew. And, and like I said, it it made the story better. And, and part part of it is because. Everybody was so invested. You know, have you ever tried to get somebody to say lines or child or whatever the deal is and they don't want to do it and they're embarrassed or whatever? And, and to do what we do well, you have to put away all of that self-consciousness and all of that worry of what am I going to look like when I do this? Or You know what I'm saying? You ha- I guess you have to trust the other people. And most of us, or at least I, am used to doing it by myself in front of a magazine. <clears throat> no. <laughs> by myself where no one can see... If I'm silly or stupid or, or whatever the deal is, and to just say, okay, I'm going to give my all in front of semi-strangers or whatever, I really respect that. Yeah. Not everybody is willing to do that. I have to admit it was a little weird doing Lauren's story especially because I was almost the only one doing it. You know? <laughs> it was just me sitting there, and I would be narrating for long stretches before another line would come along, and the lines weren't talky lines that went on for a long period and so then it was me again and I, and it was like i felt like you know i don't know one of those authors like hi today i'll be doing a reading 
arrange yourself in front of me as I... <laughs> so, and there were time, a time or two where I'm just like... It's like me in front of an audience here. I guess. And it's terrible because I felt bad because in my head there was a lot more dialogue than uh-huh. there actually was in that story. Because when you look, when you write a story, you remember certain pieces of it, and the pieces that I remembered were was the dialogue. So in my head there was a there was a good bit more dialogue than there actually was, and I was actually starting to sweat and get really nervous <laughs> after you were going on for a while, and I was feeling really bad because I was like, maybe there isn't enough dialogue. Maybe I should stop them now and write more dialogue in this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and with Risha's story, you know, I, this was a great group to be with because that's typically when I'm doing a, a story or a part, I will read it several times and I will practice it before I hit the record button. But here it was... Hey, I've never even seen this story before. Here, let's read your lines live in front of everybody. I'd never done that before, but you know, in this kind of a group, it would, it was great to do. It wasn't. If I were doing it with a bunch of strangers, I'd be more intimidated. More. We all are. <laughs> and, and a lot of us, a lot of us taught ourselves this stuff. I mean, we. It's not like we took classes in in voice acting or anything. Right. We just started had an interest. We started doing it. So. It's fun to be in a room and see how other people go about their business. I mean, no one seemed nervous. No one seemed to have any problem with doing a retake if someone asked for a retake. I mean, people seem to – I mean, I think we've all been doing this long enough. I wonder how it would have gone if we tried to do this three years ago, right? And it, it probably would have been more nervousness, more <laughs> more self-conscious, and and uh, kind of shows how much we've learned just doing this for so long. Yeah, that's definitely something that happens. You talked to us recently about always wanting to get new people and make new contacts and new friends yeah. to do parts in every project that you do. And I'm the opposite. If it could be all seven of us every week and I'd never have to depend on anybody else, I, I would jump on that just because I guess it's trust or, or uh, you know, that y'all are dependable or that, that I don't know. There, there's always been a, a hesitancy on my part, to share something that I worked on. Because a person that's not creative, they don't know that you sat there and that you worked on it and that you thought about it. And then when you weren't writing, you're like, oh, and I changed my mind. I went back or I lost some of it and had to rewrite it. And all the things that go into it. And to have somebody say, eh, that, yeah, like, that was okay, I guess, or whatever. That's crushing. And, that well, hour. <laughs> and it's like it's like Tim Burton and Johnny Depp. You find people that you're comfortable with that you know will interpret what you – what you wrote down in a certain way and in the way you intended it or that won't feel feel pressured or feel um, offended if you say, that's not exactly what I was thinking, I was thinking this. No one will go diva on you. And that's that's always a, a good thing when people don't go diva on you. I don't know. I was I was on the verge. I was just going to be like, dude, I am big freaking Anklevich. Do you know who I am? I was but trying yeah, to enslave him. How many hours do I have to read this? You have to read it for more hours. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, Big, we lost all of your narration after all. You're oh, going to do all of that again. So good that that didn't happen. We actually had to retake. The mic setup we have here is just kind of a thrown together thing. I just brought every mic that I owned and hoped that somehow we could get a lot of mics working at once, and they didn't work. Uh, for for Lauren's story, yeah, we got my narration, and that was it. So we had to go back and redo the uh, the, the lines from Brian and Rish afterwards. But we did it much more awake, so I think. <laughs> yeah, I was I was glad to redo it. Also, there was so much time between my lines and the original take. Yeah. <laughs> right. Just start counting. Start counting. Yeah. Uh, Rish. Thirty minutes later, I had a line. Yeah. Like, Rish was saying he wasn't sure if he kept his accent the same the whole way through last oh, night. Yeah, that's so a good point. now I now suppose he probably is did. Well, and it's a good learning experience as well because now, l- looking at that. There probably wasn't enough dialogue, and some of the exposition I had in there probably could have been shifted to dialogue. And um, hearing that out loud made might help me to grow as a writer. Just hearing totally, uh, just hearing it read in that in that live setting, where anywhere that I feel slightly embarrassed, I'm like, well, if I'm feeling embarrassed about it, that might be an indicator of an area where I think I need to improve, and just was not letting myself see that. It's also really interesting how stories translate to audio sometimes because one of the last stories I did before this convention happened was 
uh, Drabblecast story called Little Grace of the House of Death. And that was a really fun story. I narrated it myself, and uh, I had uh, Starla Hutchton play the main character. Uh, another guy, Pat Crane, did a couple of voices. Uh, it's a 30-minute story. I was really proud of the production value and, and all that. And when I produced it, it's only the narrator, pretty much, for the first 15 minutes of a 30-minute story. Like none, It's like a full cast. Here's a full cast guest producer. And then it's me talking with minimal sound effects for 15 minutes before stuff starts to happen. And it's a great story, don't get me wrong, And but it it's funny how certain stories just, they they don't necessarily have the balance that you might expect or, or prefer to have for a full cast type story. Right. See, I'm always relieved when there's big stretches where no sound effects are necessary. <laughs> Less production work, right? Yeah. I don't need to worry about that for a while. Ship creaking under the next 30 minutes. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, that 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 can help. Uh, a fun thing that I did a little bit last night when we were uh, recording um, is I grabbed some video with my. I think some of the others did that as well. I'm going to make sure to post that on YouTube and put uh, it up there so people can actually see the sausage being made. It's a good thing we <laughs> saved the drinking for tonight. Yeah, there you go. So uh, you want to check that out? That we'll, we'll, I'll put that in the show notes or whatever. You can go and take a look at that or maybe i'll just put it on a dune steve blog post or something i don't believe i signed a release <laughs> <laughs> oh I, I guess i'll have to do that too karaoke is coming up as soon as we're done here with this episode and we'll uh, we'll find the worst karaoke why are you looking at me <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and make sure to put that up too I couldn't. I, I looked at you because I couldn't look at myself. It's, <laughs> okay. Well, it was probably it's impossible to do. The twins, so it was like looking in a mirror. <laughs> There's no mirror for me. So what, does that over mean there. we're done? Or we are, no, I, we just, can be. I just was mentioning that is all. Okay, the one other thing I wanted to ask about was uh, that this was our first convention, and they actually asked us to speak on a panel, or, or, or someone asked Abby, and Abby asked us, and. I think there was a little hesitancy on our part. Have I used that word again? I, I do not know if it means what I think it means. Hesitation, I believe, is the word. You're Thank you, for. sir. Sir. Oh, <laughs> there are drugs for that as well. Nothing to be ashamed of. I mean, as you get older, the prostate enlarges, and you develop hesitancy. <laughs> I thought. What would There's I say to people? What would I say in front of a crowd? You know, I, I assumed there would be hundreds of people in the audience and they would right. look at this guy and they would instantly know that he is he's in no authority. He shouldn't be up on the stage. <laughs> Fraud! And I'm wondering if any of you felt that same way the first time you were on a panel or you feel that now. Because I don't feel it anymore. After having done it just the one time. And seeing what other panelists were like, and that I just I feel like, yeah, oh, I could always do this. Mm -hmm. I definitely had the uh, the moment of feeling like I was going to be outed as a fraud in front of everybody because I mean, unlike most of the rest of you, I actually haven't done a ton of production work myself, and I haven't released much of my own fiction. In fact, the story that we recorded last night is only the second story that I will have released. Um, into the podcasting sphere. And the first one was in the first couple of episodes of Pendragon Variety, so not many people have heard it. So I I not only have not released much fiction, but I, I haven't produced much fiction either. I've just been doing um, the production on Pendragon Variety podcast. So when I was invited, I was, of course, ecstatic because I've done quite a bit of voice work, but I haven't done a ton of the stuff that we were actually speaking about on the panel, though I felt like I could talk about it. I think you did very well. I think you contributed. And talking about and it, it was it was fine. Just fine. Once no. I was up there, I didn't feel like a fraud at all. That might be because there weren't that many people yeah. in the room. There was that one <laughs> dude in the blue that shirt. One guy, that so. one dude in the blue shirt stayed the whole time, and he was my he hero. And he smiled I, several I, times. I felt like, it, and it's weird because at one point I talked to that guy, but when he first sat down, it's like, does anybody know that guy? Okay, that guy is here for us. That's the guy we've got to impress. And I, I was glad he stayed there the whole time, and he smiled. And at one point, I think he even got up. We're like, uh oh, and he came closer. He did. He, right. he, he giggled. Right. On now, <laughs> several occasions. And and Rish had told me before the panel actually started. He said, "My goal is to make that guy laugh." <laughs> hey, Johnny never came back. Uh, yeah, Johnny, Johnny was. Johnny was a slave. Yeah. Bait Screw switch. that, Johnny. 
<laughs> Who's Johnny? <laughs> we don't know. She said and <laughs> smiled and yes. looked the other way. Oh, <laughs> so no, I, I wanted to hear more of you the very first time that you were asked to be on a panel. The very first panel I ever, ever was on was at PhilCon, and it was a pretty small room, like less than 20 people in it. And and that's the Phil Collins uh, convention? <laughs> it was the Su Su Studio. PhilCon is a science fiction convention in Philadelphia <laughs> that uh, I was invited to. H, it, some of the HG World producers are in the area, so they oh, I, cool. I went down to meet them. And uh, so it was a panel. Uh, what the heck was the panel about? I, th I think it was just about about vo uh, voice production type stuff. It was kind of a production panel, and mm -hmm. um, it was fun. I I uh, felt like a celebrity. It felt really cool for just to be up front and everything. Um, I think the biggest audience I've ever been on was probably the one where it was me and Norm Sherman and Starla Hutchton. Were you there, Abby? Do you remember that one? I have not been on a panel. At a Balticon. Yeah, that was at Balticon. I, the one of my three panels I, I made it to, because my other two I was... Uh, <laughs> I, oh, boy. I have no memory of a couple of those panels, I've been told. I didn't get up for them. I was dry heaving in my hotel room when, when the, t the panel was. Um, but... <laughs> That's right. Uh oh, he's Direct gonna start dry the heaving again. Norm Sherman. <laughs> but I'm gonna get him the ice the bucket or something. Before. But my my <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to panels, for me, um, I mean, maybe it just comes from my personality. But my goal going up there is okay. It, it's there's no nervousness. There's nothing like that. My goal is to make sure that I'm not talking over other people that are excited to be up there. I want to make sure that I contribute and I say things, but that I'm not trying to answer every question over other people because I've seen people like that on panels and I hate them. <laughs> and if I was ever that guy, I would be embarrassed to realize it. Uh -huh. So that that was that's always been my the most important thing for me is to to be in a public venue. You realize that, you know, unless you get some giant room of people that are just asking questions and questions and questions, um, you're not maybe as important as you think you are. Just be part, just enjoy it with the people that are up there. Get to know them a little bit. Talk about the topic and and know it's being recorded and try not to come across as a jerk. <laughs> cool. <laughs> the cliche is that the person with the least experience on the panel just monopolizes the whole panel. And I have seen this so many times. And Lauren, you do probably have the least podcasting experience. You have written as much as any of us, so I think right. you have right. you have plenty to contribute in, in the area of you know writing humor, and you have produced and stuff. But right. you, you know, you you did not monopolize the panel in any way. But that that is the cliche, and I've I've seen it. Brian's seen it. We've all seen it. Yeah, I mean the right um, the writing that. panels at Dragon Con are like the best example of that. Yeah, the person that has not put out a single thing will talk eighty percent of the time, and the experienced writers are just sort of like. Ah, up, up, <laughs> you know, Ooh, that's awful. I think the best, the best worst panel I've ever been to was at Dragon Con, and I have a couple of friends who were um, published writers up there, and we went to to support them, and it was almost like um, the Last Supper of writers and we there was honestly like somebody with their head in their hands and somebody standing up gesticulating, and you had almost the exact you could have freeze framed. A video recording and and done a painting off of it, and people would have said, "Is that the Last Supper writer's style?" It was Judas terrible. just wouldn't stop talking. Judas just would not <laughs> shut the <laughs> hell up. But anyway, no, everyone did. Well, I was nervous yesterday because I went to a couple of the panels, and should we say talk about how the focus of this conference isn't really what we sure do? Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> it's um. It's very, you know, in the New Media Expo, it's all about new media and blogging and promoting yourself and... How to make money from right. new media. And that's never been my comfort level with all of this. The most dollars out of your fans. How to milk it. <laughs> well, I realized that I hadn't updated my blog since August 5th. <laughs> and, you know, here we are. Well, I mean, that's like the, what is that, rule number one in blogging is you're supposed to regularly churn out entries. And I'm terrible about it. I know public that. public stoning here. I've always been that way. So I thought, well, gosh, I better, like, update my blog because, you know, here I am, supposedly an expert at new media. So I did that. And, you know, I went and they're talking about all this you know, monetizing and marketing. And I thought, gosh, you know, I don't know if I belong here. But 
And then I thought, well, about the subject that we're talking about, I do know what I'm talking about and right. I have something yeah. to share. So once I started thinking that way, you know, it's okay that I'm not a great social media guru. but um, And I really appreciate, because we had a separate panel, uh, Marshall and Brian and I, and I really appreciate you guys being there and oh, contributing yeah. and I hope that I didn't totally dominate. <laughs> oh, I just no. had the points thing, that I wanted to make. So <laughs> The thing with you two, with Abby and Renee, is... You two headed up your panel. You you were the moderators. You were in charge of setting everything up. So you had a, a lot more responsibility than we did. Did that make you more nervous than the rest of us? Because you were our leaders. If one of us looked bad, it makes you look bad. Well, see, yeah, my brain just doesn't think that way. I was worried, but not about that. I was worried that I wouldn't have it set up well for them. You, you know, that they would show up and it would be totally, you know, a big problem. There was a slight technical problem, but it wasn't. The ends of the audio clips cut out for some uh -huh. weird reason. It ended up being funny, though, because because everybody could complete them anyway. Yeah. You <laughs> but, just weren't uh, worried about that happening because Rish wasn't on your panel. I think that's why. <laughs> Abby was terrified. She told me yesterday. She's like, what, 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 what might Rish say? I don't want to. I knew that Marshall and Brian had great things to contribute on the topic. It was all about narrating and putting um, emotion and capturing the correct tone of the story with the narration. And I knew they had a lot to contribute, and I just wanted to make sure that you guys had a chance to, to add to it. Well, and I also think the panels were different types of panels. I mean, our, our panel was, taught, was a little bit more of a discussion-based one where we talked about humor and how humor worked and the uses of humor, and yours was a little bit more of a how-to panel. So it made sense that you had the bullet point asking the question and then answering and then getting the feedback from the producers. So that that made sense to me and I don't think you dominated it too much. I look at I look at Renee and I just think dominatrix. Yes. Yes. I don't know what the link is. So. By the way, oh sorry, I was gonna say. Uh, by the way, so we we keep going into detail about these panels. Um, if you want to hear these panels. They are available to listen to, and uh, there will be a link in the show notes that you can go and click on to listen to it. If you maybe you want to just pause the show now, go listen to them and come back so you know what we're referring to. Go ahead and uh, and do that if you'd like. Uh, we're now going to pass the baton over to Marshall Latham and hear his. I appreciated uh, being invited on the panel. It gave me an excuse to come meet all you guys and and to have fun. Uh, that's been the best part of being here. Same here. Um, but as, as far as being a, being on the panel, I really wasn't nervous. I, I don't mind being in front of people talking talking about things that I, I enjoy. But it was interesting when I was up on the panel and when I started talking about something, right right in the middle of what I was talking, I, I started thinking, am I making any sense? Is this, you know, <laughs> is this really important? Am I adding to the conversation? You know, But before, I'm not nervous about it, but as I'm speaking, I'm thinking, should I just shut up now and let let, let us move on? But this was your first panel as well. Well, yes, it was. I do the same thing, and I did the exact same thing you were you're talking about because it's also my first panel that I've ever been on. But the bad part is when I start thinking, "Am I talking too much?" I stop in the middle of the sentence, and I feel everyone start looking at me, <laughs> and then I'm like, I "Have to keep talking." What was I talking about? I don't even remember. Oh, it's, it's okay. It's a comedy panel, <laughs> and, but no, it, it's an awful feeling. But yeah. Uh, so anyways, um, they did already say that they wanted us to come back next year. Mm -hmm. And they also said that they wanted to expand the whole fiction thing of podcasting. Fiction They've wing. got, right, okay, the fiction wing. They wanted to build a new wing onto it with the fiction wing. Right. They wanted to add humanities to their business and science. There you go. Um, curriculum here right. at the NMX University. They wanted to give podcasters a chance to talk about the art half of podcasting. As a scientist, it's much more business than science that, that I saw here. There you go. So just it's a, just a, business. I was making an... I was met metaphoring. <laughs> no, it, it was interesting because I, I went to... Uh, they have something here called the Podcast uh, People's Choice Awards. Uh, and I went that I went to that... Uh, Last night, I guess it was, uh, you guys all went out for pizza or something. Mm -hmm. I, I was trying to meet uh, Doc Artemis from the Brain Science Podcast, which I, I got to meet her. She actually came to our panel. Uh, she's really cool. Um, but we, I went there and um, got to see the awards that are the, – the People's Choice Awards are really interesting. I don't think they're actually sponsored by 
the new media expo they're not. That just hosted here but they're a popularity contest it comes from you getting nominated in the most votes so the shows that have the biggest audiences and who would you know ask for votes the most ask for votes or have some <laughs> gimmicky thing would be the ones that just get people that are go to the website and click things over and over and over again so i don't know how that works in terms of being a really good judge of what's good quality versus what's just popular um so it's a popularity award it's fine well that's any awards show though um almost any awards show is going to be subjective and where that subjectivity lies, whether it's with the people who are diehard fans and will go in and, you know, call the number 20 times or go and click the button every single day, it's hard to get a an accurate judge of, of what is quality and what is good versus what is popular. Because we all know some real crap is popular in, in just about everything. Yeah, but the, the Parsec Awards are a different system, right? Because I, I've... the the full cast podcast would have never won a popularity contest because I, I fly out don't have enough listeners to, to be in a popularity contest with writing excuses or something else that would be in that category. Mm -hmm. right. There's just no way. Pendragon never would have gotten nominated. Or final five, right? Or final five, yeah. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. That's a different system. This this award is completely based on votes. On votes. So. Uh, the winner of the People's Choice Award for this year was uh, ESPN's Fantasy Football podcast, which gets – I talked to – I met at the dinner after. There was free beer next door, so I went there. Clearly. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I was – I ended up in a standing in a circle with uh, Pod Vader, who is the guy who does all the ESPN podcasting. He's the guy who got roped into it um, as an audio, radio producer that – your job is this now type guy. Uh, and Matthew Berry's wife was there, and Matthew Berry was kind of there, and he would leave and come back. <laughs> so it was the, the four of us standing in a circle and talking about podcasting and awards and stuff, and they told me some of their numbers. They get they, – they have five episodes a week that come out for that show, mm -hmm. um, and they their downloads in the month are 7 million downloads. Wow. And that's two million of the seven million are completed downloads. They do they have total clicks and total downloads and listen to the end. Um, so you get a sense of the scale of podcast that's going to just win, blow away anyone that's got even a moderate audience. But my hope is that even though I get what you're saying that it's not maybe the most objective way of judging quality, I still hope they end up with a podcast fiction category for the podcast awards, just because I think that will help bring podcast fiction in, you know, just be noticed yeah. among other people who listen to podcasts. I think it'll bring podcast fiction people here to New Media Expo. Right. And within each category, I mean, you can expect there to be the popular ones are the ones that tend to have the highest quality, even if that quality is somewhat manufactured in the sense that it is from <laughs> the businesses or the larger um, the larger news venues like ESPN, where they have the seasoned professionals um, doing the same thing they normally do, but in a different in a different medium. And I mean, obviously, those are going to be the most searchable, and so those are going to be the first ones that pop up, and the first ones that most people who are just casually looking for a podcast to listen to are going to find and listen to. So hopefully, if they do expand the uh, different var the variety of awards that are there, and they come up with a podcasting fiction award, they'll start pulling from the podcasting fiction area and the numbers. Like uh, Nathan Lowell has in, and Scott Sigler have have great numbers and stuff like that will start to also show where quality is as well. Oh, yeah, I think so. And I think, um, you know, they have a bunch of categories for those podcast awards. And so I don't know, maybe every winner was really high profile with millions of downloads. But I don't know. I mean, some of those categories were kind of. Strange. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't go, so I don't know. I just looked it up on the website. LBGT was yeah. one. There's a religion category that was won by an atheist podcast. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> but yeah, we did suggest that they put in a fiction uh, thing. And the guy said, well, you know, again, it's not New Media Expo thing. There's a different guy who runs it all by himself. We'll oh, try and question. get him to put one in yeah, because it would help. Talk. Yeah, they're going to see what they can do. So who knows? Maybe next year at this time we'll find we'll be saying, "Hey, please vote for the oh, Dune, oh, Steve." Oh. Um, <laughs> Everyone vote for 
<laughs> no, turn it into. <laughs> so, uh, oh, no. and then we won't be friends anymore because we'll have to choose our loyalty. Yeah, we shall see. But uh, hopefully, hopefully by this time next year. So hopefully, at the very least, they say that they want the podcasting fiction thing to be more a big deal. So they're going to have us back, and maybe they'll have more uh, other speakers back. Um, so I guess you can like consider marking it on your calendar. We, we suggested to them that they should have us do what we did in our hotel room, actually live on stage, where we do... <laughs> <laughs> I think he means recording yes. the, the we live. We didn't do that in our hotel room. Come on, folks. Abigail Hilton will be showering live. <laughs> live on stage. New media That's not fair. She's not here. <laughs> She's not here to defend herself. Okay, fine. Brian Lincoln will be showering yeah, well, live. That's going to happen anyways. He... <laughs> Free beer. <laughs> but uh, yeah, if they this... pay the flight. I'll do anything. There you go. But doing a live story. Yes, reading. doing a live story reading like we did in our hotel room will be done on stage live, and even have a discussion afterwards live. So uh, you can look forward to something like that if you uh, in the Vegas area nearby, willing you to pay tweet. for a flight, etc. You can tweet the uh, the people by saying, "Hey, have the podcast live live fiction readings." Hashtag NMX. There you go. Yeah, hashtag <laughs> NMX and ask for uh, more fiction. More podcast. Fiction. But uh, I mean, on a serious note, I mean, despite the fact that we came to this thing as sort of a small group of podcasters that were invited and know each other and weren't exactly going to run into other podcasters here because it was the first year they have tried to bring us in and. Uh huh. I've met people here that I never thought I'd get a chance to meet or, or was excited to get a chance to meet. I mean, first cool. of all, you guys being nearby. Mm -hmm. But I met Doc Artemis, like I said, from the Brain Science Podcast, who's somebody I, one of the people I first, one of the first podcasts I listened to as a scientist. I love educational podcasts, and she has one of the best ones out there. I met Scott Johnson here, who it's got to be a big kind of award show for him to come out because he's, he's a big wig in, in the field and only goes to certain events in the year. Um, I got to meet Pod Vader from ESPN. I, I didn't think I'd ever meet like somebody I've seen on TV at ESPN, like Matthew Berry. That was really cool. Th it was it was kind of <clears throat> mingling with other groups. Like I met a couple people that do video production, mm -hmm. from, like, like sort of Hollywood type people. people. Yeah, you who get do that. web content, uh, and they were really excited about the audio drama, audio story people. Like, oh, that stuff exists. You know? <laughs> like, they, people are not aware of it. And I think that in order, one thing that I've always been is is somebody who sort of crosses borders. Like, I feel like I helped, I helped meet people in the audio short fiction group, like you guys. And I, I know, like, yeah, that's like, how I wouldn't have. Yeah, people I like Renee. Be here if it weren't right. for Brian. People like Same Renee. Here, I mean, people like Renee yeah. who do audio fiction, like full novel. That those are two com different communities, the the anthology people and the long fiction people. And by using voices from one or the other, and I, I get voices from other kinds of podcasting that I try to bring in and, and sort of get people to cross the aisle, so to speak, and, and get a sense of this other area of podcasting that exists. I think that if podcast authors want to get the word out, then mingling with people with big audiences like this place offers – is the way you can meet the kind of people who, if they mention you to their audience, you're going to have 100,000 people find out about your show. Sure. And I mean, I my podcast is very small. It is still very small. But we did see an upturn in listeners as soon as I mean, I had never done any podcast acting before, before I did some for Brian, um, for Brian, for Dune Steve. And that actually started, we did get a trickle of new listeners after everything that I was in after that. And that was really nice to, uh, to start expanding the audience that way. But conventions are great. And, you know, even though the New Media Expo was not really geared toward um, fiction and artists uh, more than as much as it was geared toward business and trying to make money off of the products, um, it was still a really good opportunity. And it was nice to come over to this coast ish near the, near the coast. coast it was nice to go west and meet people that i didn't think i'd get a chance to meet as well like um the dune steve team and renee and marshall cool and, and sleeping abby <laughs> 
Okay. Uh, we have run out of time. We're going to have to cut this off. We could probably go yeah. on forever, but we're supposed to be at karaoke. Marshall has to catch a plane, so we got to get moving. We'd like to thank everybody for joining us, for helping us to get this show done, and uh, we're going to go ahead and bid everyone adieu. Yes. Hey, I on on my own behalf, thanks a lot for doing that. I, I feel very lucky that all of you guys spent that much time and are still doing it. For, I mean, it's not for me, but but I got to reap the most benefit of all. For Cause, art! Because it was my story. and uh, Right. Okay, well, but th- I thank you anyway. It made me feel big. And that's usually... It made me job. feel rich. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note... All right. What, stay, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> but Thanks gets podcasted relentlessly. We'll Good see you later. Good night, folks. Thanks for listening. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files. There's something undeniably creepy about you, Big Anklevich. Take two. Office Visit by Rish Outfield. The hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to know whenever a picture gets taken. <laughs> On Main Street, they hit the gas station to buy an ice cream, walking their bikes as they ate them. They hate their bikes? <laughs> <laughs> Brainwashing his parents into thinking he does a good job? Or patience. Patience. Oh, his parents. (laughs) (laughs) Brainwashing his (laughs) parents. You're really into brainwashing parents. (laughs) The par- I don't know. Okay. Why is it so small? Now I see what you're talking about. That's what she said. Oh. Prompt for the audience is to write a comment on the on the forums talking about what they think the Marco Polo thing is. Yes, yes. Discuss. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> yeah. Bonus points if you if you do a YouTube video tutorial. The Close Marco your eyes Polo and thing. open your mouth. The Marco Polo technique. Four part web series. But it was too late to turn back now, no matter how wildly her heart was beating in her screensaver. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Plowman was... St- Dr. Plowman. Dr. Plowman! Dr. <laughs> <laughs> Plowman! Take form of plow! <laughs> Be the thing that hangs at the back of the throat. The uvula. Jeannie surprised herself by knowing. Very good, young lady. The ovula. The, 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 <laughs> <laughs> uh, are you really a dentist? <laughs> I also did a little bit. Very good, young lady. The uvula. It's subtle. Very invasive. Barely. Barely. <laughs> subtle, but also very <laughs> It's subtly extremely invasive. <laughs> And there came an aberrant gurgle in the back of his throat. It sounded like a death rattle. Shia. Can you do? Back in. <laughs> Tears rolled down her cheeks as she yanked her bicycle from where it lay in the bushes beside the post office, riding off as fast as her legs would take her. Wow, I'm a bitch. <laughs> See ya. I need my friend in peril. There is nothing we won't try. Never heard the word impossible this time. There's no stopping us. Cut it out.